By way of very quick introduction, um, my name is Dev. I serve as the chief executive to Nplan. I'm one of two founders of the business as well. Um, I'm not going to talk to you in detail about what Nplan does, um, but instead, we are here today because uh, over the past four and a half years, Nplan has now read and understood how approximately 500,000 project schedules have evolved over time. That's a lot of projects, in other words. Uh, we've seen how a lot of construction projects, it's, it's about 1.2 trillion US dollars worth of capital that has been deployed around the world. And we've just seen how they've done, right? We've seen what they originally planned to do. We see how they actually turned out. And this is, for the very first time, our sharing of what we've learned. And my hope is that you leave today with a sense of education, and more importantly, a sense of inspiration. We hope, I, I sincerely hope that you see something here today and you hear something here today that helps you go back into your respective organizations uh, and, and to do something differently, right? The whole point of analyzing information that how we've done things in the past is that we can use this knowledge, pardon my language, not screw it up again, right? Um, I think that would take us a very long way if we, if we could do that. Um, I'll introduce my panelists. Um, we've got some excellent perspective here today. Uh, they all come from very different backgrounds, and that's very purposeful. I wanted to make sure that we are able to communicate to you in a way that you felt you got a rounded opinion on it, not just this one data opinion that I'm going to throw at you today. Um, to my far left is Claire Smith. Uh, Claire is the editor of The New Civil Engineer. Um, Claire is a geotechnical engineer by background and has been in the construction industry as a journalist for 22 years. So she brings an excellent, call it rounded perspective of how the whole industry has been uh, performing. The New Civil Engineer has just recently celebrated its 50th year. Thank you for that celebration event. Um, and, and so it's, it's in, she has excellent perspective that she'll share with you shortly. Glenn uh, is the Director of Clients, Strategy and Markets, or Markets, Client, Strategy. Any order is fine. With Langer Oak. Um, uh, Glenn's with the Lang Glenn has been with Langer Oak uh, for, for five years now um, and, uh, and comes with a mathematics background, um, which for the construction industry is a bit of a rarity. Um, he, ha he brings um, a really rounded perspective of not just what is happening from the contractor's perspective, but also what that means for the industry and how they operate as, a, as an organization. And to my right is Simon Murray. Um, Simon uh, has had an, has, he's not, it's not past tense, um, <laughs> a, uh, a very wide ranging career uh, from rail track to uh, a non-executive director with National Highways, Highways England, one of those two organizations. Um, and currently a non-executive director with East West Rail, the railway line connecting Oxford and Cambridge. Um, Simon also advises the Irish government on their transport policy um, and uh, thrilled to have him here um, as he's got lots of ground experience as well with BAA Terminal 5? 2? 5. 5, yes, excellent. Um, so with that, um, we're going to get started. The way we'll do this is we've got some insights that we'll share with you. Uh, we'll ask the panelists for their opinions. Um, we will go through these insights first, and then we'll welcome the audience to engage in with questions, right? So you'll see all the insights, and then you can come in and ask us the questions that are burning inside your mind. To get things going, um, I'm gonna call this the warm-up slide. Um, uh, one in every seven large projects finishes on time. Um, I had to like have a positive slant on that, right? One in every seven, that's not uh, zero in every seven. Um, that means um, we, we, we do generally experience uh, delays on projects. Um, this is, just to contextualize the data you're seeing here, uh, between 2005 and 2021. So it is a very wide range of um, projects that we've been an analyzing. Um, and these are the large projects only. So we as Nplan have exposure to, call it large capital projects, and so out of the large ones, we see a significant chunk of them are delivered late. Um, the, 
The interesting thing inside here, though, is why is it that one in seven is not an expanding number? Why is it that we, I, I suppose when I first saw this slide, I was considering deleting it and, and not including it today, because I was like, everyone has seen this already, or, or a version of this, or a bad number that also says construction projects usually get laid, right? So we're not telling you anything new here. The question that I'd like to like, go around and ask my panelists about is why do you think this number doesn't change? Why do you think this is the status quo that N plan and McKinsey and insert someone else that's kind of done this kind of analysis before? Uh, why do we think we always keep reporting the same thing? Um, maybe we can start with Simon. And I'm yeah. going to sit down now. <laughs> yeah, I just want to preface my remark by just saying uh, I'm here in my personal capacity this evening. And, and so, you know, these are my personal views. They don't reflect the views necessarily of East West Rail. So that enables me to go off piste a bit. Um, and and I, I, when I looked at this slide a bit, uh, a bit like Dev, I thought to myself, well, you know, so what are you, what, what, what are you telling me that's new? You know, we knew that. Um, and then I thought to myself, Actually, when you think about large capital projects, they tend to be infrastructure projects. You know, once you get it into the billions of euros or billions of pounds. Um, and certainly my experience of working on these infrastructure projects is that as they, over the last 10, 15, 20 years, as they become larger and larger, they not all only become more complex in terms just of the, their very nature, but they become technologically more challenging. And also, they invariably take place on existing networks. So, you know, you don't, very, in my, my career, very rarely have I ever seen anybody been given the honor of building a brand new railway that doesn't, you know, that isn't connected to another railway. And so I think the insight I would leave you with is what we're talking about here is increasing complexity of interfaces, of technology, of innovation. And maybe, Deb, the reason it's not getting any better is because that complexity has been increasing significantly. And it raises a question which I'll come back to later on, I think, which is, are our arrangements for managing, planning and managing these projects actually fit for purpose anymore? Do they work? Yeah. Then? Um, I guess, yeah, by, by way of background, I, I used to just lead Langer Rock's strategy team, and then I thought, I think they thought that I should sort of face some cold, hard facts from, from clients head on. <laughs> so they added the clients and markets piece to that. Um, and I guess when you're talking about these large projects, they're often over multiple years uh, and you know I, I was with a client yesterday who has a large potential uh, scheme it's a buildings project but probably about 300 million pounds of value and they openly admitted that they don't really know what they want yet but they know when they want it finished and so there's you know there's enormous kind of uncertainty about exactly what they want and that is going to evolve and there's this you know tendency to want to get started and as you know, builders, we want to start, you know, we want to dig a hole, we want to fill it with concrete, and we, we trust that all the other decisions will be made in time such that that end date can be hit. But ultimately, there's so many other factors there that mean that there's, there's just so much scope for them to change what they want in that time. Uh, and some clients admit that, so it was a very enlightened client yesterday. Others, others don't. You can get these very adversarial sort of uh, discussions then, which contributes even further to delays. But I guess it's the... Um, you know, when you're looking at it over multiple years, it doesn't surprise me because it, it's, we don't live in this perfect world where what the client wants from this project won't be different in three years from what they wanted when they signed that first contract with us. Yeah. I think that's really interesting what you're saying about the end date because that's one of the things that I think Crossrail hung themselves on was setting the date as December 2018. And I've never really worked out exactly how they picked that date and how they picked it down to... 31 days to deliver the project, probably 10 years in advance. I think they kind of gave themselves a deadline that they couldn't actually work to, and no one actually reviewed that during the project. So it makes me wonder, how do we set the date, end date for these projects? This number of projects that are late, are they actually late? Or have we given ourselves unrealistic targets? Are we not being honest with ourselves about the scale of work we're trying to deliver? So just coming back to Crossrail again, when you look at some of the stations, I don't know if any of you have been down in some of the station buildings there, they're mega projects in their own right. So you've got a whole series of mega projects. And I don't think we're really thinking about the complexity and the knock-on effects of one mega project on another, on another, on another. Mm -hmm. So we're really not giving ourselves much of a chance. Yeah. So actually, if we're realistic, how many projects are actually late? 
and you know what the second slide is. <laughs> um, so um, this is this is uh, now, now we're going to start getting warmed up. Um, um, this is some interesting information because I thought only the very largest projects in the world, um, the high speed twos, the cross rails, um, are the ones experiencing the delays. Um, we use a little proxy because at, at NPLAN we cannot see the cost of the project, right? Per project, we, we can't see that. Um, so we use a, a different heuristic, which is the duration of a project. We say the long, the super long projects, the thousand day plus the projects are the are the expensive ones, and, and then the, the the shorter ones, the less than year project, you'd say they're cheap, right, or cheaper. Um, based on that, um, we start to see actually that short the the, the very shortest projects um, don't have a huge uh, tendency towards delay, but if you uh, if your if your eyes can do some mathematics. And you divide the uh, the left-hand y-axis by the x-axis, and you try and normalize the effect of a delay. Right. So you say, I have a year-long project. How many days, on average, or in the median, do I do those projects get delayed? And then you do that for the very longest project, and then divided by the amount of delay, you might actually see a positive trend. You, you might actually see that the long, very longest projects in the world in percentage terms don't actually get delayed by a dramatic amount. The thing is, as people, we hear a three-year delay on cross -air. It's three years. My God, isn't that bad? Three years as a percentage of the total duration they've expended on that project. Is it that bad now? Question, right? Um, I, I, I won't give you the answer. Um, we also see the, the particular family of projects, the particular duration that ends up being, call it the most susceptible one, right? It's the messy middle and the, uh, uh, call it about two years long projects. Um, I, I, I'm interested in, 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 this, um, in this debate around, as Claire, Claire spoke about Crossrail, where uh, Crossrail is a series of mega projects um, and high speed two in in a similar vein. Um, I'm interested in understanding how how you perceive, or how you think. Sorry, uh, the industry is perceiving this complexity. I think it links a little bit with Simon's point earlier that we're not building easier things with time. Things are just getting harder and harder. Um, I'm interested how you how you think of complexity against um, delay. So where you think the shortest, quicker projects are less complex. Or not, right? Uh, if you see it differently, um, I think it's a case of um, the way we manage projects. So at the moment, it's always one controlling mind, or that's the way we perceive it. I think we need to think about having teams to actually deliver the projects and look at it that way. Yeah. Um, there's no one way, no one person that can actually have that idea of how the whole project's going to go. I think we need to evolve project teams as well, so that they've got those specialist skills. I think at the moment we don't do that on any project, small or large. It's usually one person trying to follow it all the way through. Mm. And perhaps they haven't got those skills to do it. So we talk about Crossrail again. I think, um, Simon, you were saying earlier, but it was perceived as a tunneling project. And it's not. It's a systems integration project as well. And that wasn't really quite thought through. So it wasn't necessarily the civil engineers that should have been controlling the whole thing. So I think that maybe all projects need to think about evolving leadership. Yeah, I think <coughs> I, I agree. I absolutely agree with Claire on that. I, I, I think there's a much deeper issue here. I think there is a massive, what I might call a cultural disparity between the people that invest in, in, in infrastructure and the people that deliver it. And I started out my, I spent the first half of my career um, on the delivery side and the second half of my career on the owner side, working for big infrastructure companies. Um, and when you work for an owner, you see these problems completely differently. They're, not, they're, le they're less about projects than about investments to take your business forward. Now, the cultural difference or the cultural disparity I see here is that within the delivery system, there's a tendency for people to quite like bigness. You know, there's this idea of I've done a bigger project than you. And I think Claire's really onto something. Uh, and and I, I think there's a serious cultural issue with the whole project management fraternity and this obsession with the role of the project manager as if this one superhero can solve all your problems. 
If you look at it through the owner's eyes and look at it as, a, as an investment, it usually breaks down into a series of sub-investments and they add up to moving your business forward. So, you know, Terminal 5, which I worked on for many years, that, that you could break that down into pieces um, and, and the whole thing had to work together to carry the business forward. And what you're constantly trying to do as an owner is not make big pr projects, you're trying to make small ones. And in fact, I remember at one point when I, when I was back in the days when I worked in the airports, um, we, we did an analysis of all of our investments. And what was fascinating is if, you, if your metric is not delay, but your metric is return on investment, it was the small incremental investments that were always the most successful. And it was the enormous ones that we had to make that tended not to be successful. So the art was to break these enormous things down, as Claire was suggesting, into pieces if you possibly can. Yeah. Come to you in this next one. So the, the next part um, talks about the, the scale of delay, right? Um, and, and this one is a tough one because we're, we're trying to like assess delay across all of the projects, bearing in mind these are projects of varying sizes, of varying industries. We do have some industry breakdowns coming up a little bit later where we have the, the, league, of, the league of construction. Um, but the, the, effectively we're saying here that for the most part, um, you, you're getting project outcomes, uh, pro, pro, projects end up getting slightly delayed, right? Um, what I'm interested in exploring a little bit with Glenn, um, I'd love to understand a little bit more about, let's just call this the cultural dynamic of data versus the field. Uh, field was probably the wrong word <laughs> to describe it as, um, where you show this information, right? So at then plan, we can produce a forecast that says this is the most probable outcome for, for a project. Um, it's basically data that says something about, uh, about, about an outcome. Uh, this on the screen is data about an outcome. Um, yet, uh, there is, uh, my perception is there's, there's some cultural challenges to receiving data. Uh, and I'm interested in exploring a little bit with you, Glenn, right? Like what, as, as someone that, I think you can straddle both, both sides. You can, you can interpret data and you can understand the practicalities of the field, right? How, how do you think um, this stuff lands? Uh, I think it lands um, pretty badly if it delivered cold, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> has, has been my experience. You know, especially if you know, my background is not construction and engineering, and so that I think there can be sometimes uh, a little bit of a, who is this guy and what is this data? Where did you get it and how did you get it? Um, so there, there, there's, there's definitely, can be a cultural resistance to wanting to believe what the data says. And also because you know, the, the people working on these projects, they are enormously complex. And so they, they almost, maybe they do believe the data, but if there's all this context around that particular project, which is very emotional as to why this has happened and to bring it back down to just a, a data point and say, you know, what would you do if you knew this was in advance? Um, you know, they might think, well, what if you knew all these other things in advance that we've had to go through? And you know, what about the planning? And what about this permit that got delayed? And all of these, these things that come together. Um, so I think you know, it, it is important to give, you know, we've certainly found, um, you know, in, including when engaging with yourself, it's important to make sure you have um, people in the right headspace to want to engage with this. It's absolutely critical to get that buy-in and get people curious about how this could help them do their, do their job better uh, create more value for themselves, more value for those people around them, uh, rather than it sort of being perceived when sort of presented cold um, as, you know, we're trying to hit them over the head with something. I think, you know, the, the headlines that you always see around construction in the, uh, in the press around it, you know, delays, over budget, unsafe, all these things actually really quite, you know, rankle the people that I've, I've met in this industry who, you know, they see the building they've built and they take their children there to see it. And they're quite emotional about the legacy that they've left and what that asset does. And it feels like often, you know, the headline about late and delayed and over budget misses the point of what they feel about these projects. Um, but, you know, it's, it's around turning people's mind to say, we have this data here, we can use it to try and combat some of those, those bad headlines uh, and improve the performance. Yeah. I'm going to move to the next one and then we'll go to... Claire and Simon. 
Um, so this is our little um, league table um, where we've tried to, tried to compare different types of um, uh, sectors in the construction industry. Um, we had to be very careful of let's not, um, be, for very obvious reasons, Enplan can't reveal uh, which client for which of our clients. Uh, we can't attribute the client's performance onto a slide in a public forum. Um, but uh, what we can do is talk about an industry, uh, and we have several clients in each of these industries. Um, what this uh, little graph is trying to show you is uh, how good are we at planning? How good is each industry at planning? Um, and the larger, this is called a box and whisker diagram. Um, and so it's effectively, the larger the box is, the larger, the wider the thing gets, the more variable the planning outcomes are, the, the more um, or the less accurate your planners tend to be over time, right? So this means that I think it's 10 days and then it actually ends up being 20 days. I've got a 10 day variance on my, on my plan. Um, and at the bottom of the league table is the energy industry. Um, where they, they very frequently, at, at, at I guess the, the, the widest um, extremity, the extremities of planning. So you end up with really wild outcomes on, on, in the energy industry is what we're saying here. Um, and what I found quite surprising was that in, uh, there are different ways you can interpret the league table here. Um, that heavy infrastructure is better than buildings. Um, and you could, you could flip that around and say that if you look at the box the, where, where call it most of the data lives, uh, it's a narrower band inside buildings, right? Which makes sense. Or, or you're, uh, if you compare building crossrail to building an apartment building, um, it wouldn't be a surprise for me to say that building an apartment should be more, you should be more confident about how that thing is going to turn out. Uh, versus how confident one should be about building an underground railway in London for the very first for the first time in a generation, um, but across remember we, we do when we talk about heavy infrastructure, we also talk about, for example, filling in potholes on a motor on a motorway. We talk about signals, um, which you know we have thousands and thousands of signals in our country that constantly get rejuvenated, right? That fall into the category of heavy industry. Um, and so what we, um, when one of my interpretations when I was looking at this, and I, and I want to take this to the panel members now, is when, when there is repetition inside, an, inside a sector, you start to see coagulation of planning outcomes, right? Which is good. Uh, you want that. You want people to feel like, I know what's going to happen to my project, and therefore um, I can see an outcome. Um, but this continual trend towards complexity keeps what, what's known as the extremities of these diagrams far apart. Um, I'm interested in hearing a little bit from, from Simon, Claire, Glenn. Like, what, what do you see out in the field? Do, do, you, do you see this? Do, does this league table add up in your head? Um, <coughs> tell, tell me more about like, your ground experiences. I, 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 I... I don't see the league table as such, the differences between different sectors. What I do see is a massive loss of information in the infrastructure construction sector, particularly in the, on the delivery side. And, and one of the great advantages of being old is you've been around for a long time and you've seen things change. And well, I graduated from Imperial College in 1973 and um, in my, during my training time I worked for Costain's. Great, great contractor, almost as good as Langer Rock. But <laughs> <laughs> they were, and, and back in those days, you know, Costain Civil Engineering, Costain International, who I worked for, they had estimators who could calculate, you know, calculate from first principles, labour, plant, and materials. Um, they had their own logistics operation, they had their own plant and everything. And what we saw in the 1980s was a shift over towards um, getting rid of all that infrastructure, human infrastructure, physical infrastructure inside construction companies and a move towards a commercial approach which was based on specifying what you wanted and going out to bid and accepting the lowest bid and what I'm very conscious of right now if you take cost as an example I keep hearing people talking about you know costs and cost consultants and when you actually drill down into it as I did on a big program the other day with my colleagues you discover that actually there's very little information about costs now, I don't want to offend anybody in the room <coughs> who works for a cost consultant, but actually you're not cost consultants, you're price consultants. 
And that's a subtly different thing. The vast majority of information we use in our planning comes from tenders and information around that. Very little of it is produced on first principles. So the general observation I'd make is that as if you look at the, the project delivery business in general, it has a massive problem with poor information, and I would suggest declining information, but hard information. And I think one of the biggest challenges, Deb, you and your organisation face is trying to work with your customers to find a way of getting back into having hard data. Mm-hmm. And I know, I know it's something that Ray O'Rourke's very keen on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, my reaction to, to this, um, I mean, I'm su- surprised with how, how different they are. Um, I guess that I have a, somewhat of a question around when the end date is of a building versus infrastructure, because we can, you know, certainly if we look at ourselves as a contractor uh, in buildings, um, you can find yourself going back for a number of years after it's complete uh, to carry out remedial works. So it's kind of, would that, if you extended it to the point that we genuinely sort of finished the building, um, would that span out a bit more? Uh, and I guess there's very different commercial models in play between the two. So. You know, typically, you know, a building's contract is a fixed price lump sum with quite sort of, you know, serious LDs or something if you, if you are late. So there's a big financial imperative to, to get it finished or at least get it declared finished. Um, I probably should say these are my own opinions as well before I get in a lot of trouble. Um, but, you know, there is something there around that. You know, certainly when we look, you know, from a strategic point of view about our portfolio mix between buildings and infrastructure, there is this kind of trying to track the data around um, you know, post-completion costs um, can, get, can get quite tricky. Uh, and there's a lot to be learned by that. And it, it can sometimes be, I think those learnings are lost because the team that, that goes in to, 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 to close that out doesn't always have that link back directly into the team planning and setting up the next job. Yeah. Right. So just going to touch on something that Simon said there. I mean, I'm not sure I can actually comment on the individual industries and sort of what the differences I see there. But you were talking about how Coste moved away from doing everything themselves. What I'm seeing is supply chains are getting longer and longer and longer. Mm. And I think you've got so many specialist companies, subcontractors, and I think that's where it makes it very difficult to see where the delay is because you don't always know because you might have someone subcontracting to someone subcontracting. So you're relying on that chain of information to actually know where you are and how late things are to yeah. make a difference. Yeah. And that happens across buildings, infrastructure, all industries. And also, I think uh, one of the changes that's happened is we got to a situation, where it, you know, the time I was talking about in the 70s, the big general contractors um, had huge amounts of information, knowledge, massive yeah. amounts of knowledge. And the transition we've been through, and I mean, it's, I give full credit to Langer Rock for, for trying to do it the old, well, not necessarily the old way, but a, a new version of the old way. And, and you always seem, to, in my mind, to be one of the few trying to do it. But if you look at generally, at, at the way contractors work, they've given up that information in, in order to be able to have harder contracts with the suppliers. Now, I, as I said earlier, I was involved in working out how to deliver Terminal 5, and one of the big breakthroughs we made back then at Heathrow, or BAA as it was then, was to contract directly with our suppliers. So we didn't go through general contractors or construction managers, we contracted directly. And what we discovered is that's where the information is. You know, if you want to know, if you want to really find out how long it takes to install a, a travelator or an escalator, you know, you need to go and talk to somebody who makes them and installs them. You don't, you know, don't go and talk to one. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, your consultants are good people and they try hard. But if you don't, if you don't make things and install them, how how can you possibly know? And I think we have a massive problem here in terms of one of the reasons, the underlying reasons why we have we have such poor planning and such poor planning or outcomes in terms of schedule is that we are not using hard information. If you compare us to other sectors, you know, I know we always compare us to the automotive industry, but if you go to um, you know, uh, an OEM, you know, like Mercedes or JLR or somebody like that, they actually understand every step in their production process. They have contracts with their suppliers that require them to provide information in real time. And consequently, they can tell you to within a very, very narrow margins you know, how many, how many man hours it took to build that car, where, you know, they, they know everything about their production system, whereas we've given up our production systems, I think. I don't know, Glenn, whether that makes any sense or not. No, it, it absolutely does. I mean, we have, um, you know, we, we do have the benefit of having, you know, roughly half of the work we mm. do is through an internal supply chain. Uh, and certainly in that period, both when we're, we're bidding for a, uh, a project or in a pre-construction agreement, 
the ability to reach directly into those specialist um, subcontract businesses that we own and get their input into genuinely what will this cost and how long it will take and also what can we do with the other parts of our business you know, to, to try and streamline activities there uh, is, is really, we think it's enormously valuable. Um, it, can, it can cause people um, sort of consternation looking externally into that because they, they, they get worried that um, we might be hiding things in that. Mm. Um, we, we try to, to combat that with providing an enormous amount of transparency around those, those costs and those activities within our, in our internal supply chain. But certainly um, you know, when, when we're sitting around a, a settlement table uh, on a Wednesday afternoon and we have the business unit leader for Expanded and the business unit leader for Crown House sitting in there knowing that we're about to sign off on a contract here that includes obligations for them that they will be measured against, that can have a very different conversation, I'd say, than if they weren't in the room uh, and then we were going to go back to them later and say, oh, we've just signed you up to this, this, this contract at this price and this, this schedule. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to move us into um, what, what I'm going to classify as the family of um, unforeseen risk. Um, th this slide starts to talk about it by simply saying it is really hard to plan at an activity level with a, with a very high degree of confidence. The perfect graph, by the way, is, is, is a straight line uh, vertically at number one on the far extreme right hand side. That's, that's perfection uh, in the world. Um, so we're a little bit uh, distant from that. Um, and here is, is, is one that, that definitely stands out. Um, uh, the median delay increase uh, due to the pandemic. Um, so it won't be a huge news flash to say that construction projects got delayed or their delay increased as a result of the pandemic. Um, many, many projects uh, uh, in the public realm and private realm have, have experienced this. Um, many of them did not foresee a pandemic and did not have risk contingencies available for, for such an event. Um, the, the under, uh, I, there was a bit of a debate uh, internally at Enplan when we were creating these slides. Um, the thing that I find interesting about this, um, so we're saying on one side, projects got delayed, but underlying this data is that we know that activities, so the granular part of the work that was executed on site or in an office sometimes, um, was not getting delayed. This means that if you are planning to spend five days to pour concrete, you still spent five days pouring concrete, generally speaking, right? Um, but that delay is not small. That's not a small uh, impact on projects, um, especially when you compare it for thousands and thousands of projects, right? So what was happening is that activities seemed to be okay, yet project duration started ballooning, right? Which meant that there's, in, in planning terms, there was spaces being created. Uh, and in part, this is often due to waiting times. This is down to like lower productivity. But the, the thing that I was always told from the field, and I'd love to hear field stories on this one, is that because of social distancing and lack of workforce, we are unable to work as productively as we used to. Where, but if you corroborate that with I'm saying that activities were not getting late. Like individual pockets of work were not getting late. Um, instead, we were getting spaced out. At, uh, the activities were getting socially distant. Um, you know, does that corroborate with what you actually saw out in the field? And if not, why, why do we think there's such a difference between, between these two things? We'll start with that. So I'd be interested to know what, how much of that delay is down to the lockdowns when the sites actually stopped work completely and how much is down to social distancing mm. because it's all lumped in together so it's kind of hard to know. But I know you're talking to Tideway because they've been quite public about the delays they had and what they did about it. They were saying about the challenges they had in terms of delay on site was that the activities could continue because they, they put people into groups together so they worked in like little families to do operations but they had to decouple those operations, so they couldn't have, say, three of them happening one of, all at the same time. They had to have one happening, and then the next one, and then the next one. So I think that's where those delays come in. So individually, those operations could, weren't delayed, but they just couldn't all happen at the same time. 
and that's where some of the delays come in. Yep. Um, I won't give too many field stories because I don't think I would have the credibility to walk back into Langer Rock <laughs> opining on what it was like in the field um, coming from strategy. Uh, but certainly, you know, a anecdotally, um, you know, it, it certainly people sort of were suggesting to me that the, the actual, the, the task that we were doing, we were getting more productive at those tasks because we had to make sure that for that task to happen, we had thought through the materials would be there and that subcontractor would be there and we knew that you couldn't do that. So I think it really honed in on sort of detailed planning yeah. um, of the logistics and you know, the, the, the labour plant and materials that needed to be there to get that task done. And so I don't have any data across the board, but certainly anecdotal people are saying you're actually getting, we're showing we can do some of these tasks far more productively because we're more prepared for them. Um, but I guess across the, the piece that planning for that was not, not as efficient uh, as, as it could be, so that must be the, the delays. Yeah. You know, I, I, the impression I get, I don't have any hard data on it, the impression I get is that um, we managed to uh, move very, very quickly to put in place arrangements to let people do their work reasonably efficiently. But what we, and, and it's not just in the sector we were working, I, I'd say, I, I've read, read around what happened to other sectors, what we didn't spot early enough was the effects of the pandemic in disrupting supply chains. And, and, and what you end up with, and I don't know whether you could get this out of your data at some point, um, Dev, I think, I think you would find that a large percentage of the activities, as you were saying, went perfectly normally, and a few were massively disrupted, and that impacted on the entire mm -hmm. program. So I remember you telling me ages ago that for analysis you did, where you said, even, you know, even when, pro when projects go badly wrong, a very high percentage of the activities still are done on time. Correct. And, I, and, and I, I we'll get onto this in a minute in one of the future slides, but, um, but I would say if you think the pandemic was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet in terms <laughs> of supply chain disruption. Uh, and what this is exposing is, and it's not just the sector I, we work in, it's across industry in general, it's exposing our, 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 our dependency and our assumptions about the effectiveness of global supply chains. And it's also exposing our lack of detailed knowledge of where all the bits come from mm -hmm. and, what, and, what, and where the critical... I mean, a classic example of this, which is going on right now, you've probably read about in the automotive industry, is they've only just woken up, well, the German car manufacturers in particular, have only just woken up to the fact that most of their wiring harnesses are made by is it 17 firms in Ukraine. And all of the people who wired up the harnesses are now wearing combat uniforms and, and, and in the eastern end of the country fighting a war. So, so you, you know, if you want to, if we want to protect ourselves against these things, we have to know that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is diving a little bit into the detail here. Um, so, what gets delayed? What causes uh, projects at large to get delayed? Um, the thing that comes out here is, it's not really the production stuff. It's administrative stuff. Um, there is a huge, it, it happens to be that one top of the league is structural steel, there's tons of structural steel delays going on in, in supply chains at the moment, but look at, look at the cumulative effect that, um, that these, call it administrative tasks, uh, administrative activities, um, create on the outcomes of a project. You will also remember that structural steel is not the entire project, whereas review and approval can appear throughout the project, right? Like it's not, it's, it's, it just will constantly happen on projects. Um, you don't just do it at the very start of a project. You could have review and approval. I mean, Crossrail had to go through a review and approval to the Office of Rail and Rail and Transport, I think, oh, right. um, or uh, <coughs> a couple of weeks ago. Um, the, so this tendency of uh, focusing, focusing teams on production, so physical production, so how fast can we pour concrete? How fast can we, uh, how many crews do, are we going to require to like cable, to, to install these cables and terminate them? That is a very like human and in, human intuition to, to go towards the thing that you can imagine as the production of work. We are we're actually quite good at this. Um, what we're awfully bad at is estimating risk on the things that we can't visualize. We cannot visualize how long someone else on the other side of the world or table is going to take to interpret the content we send them. 
right? In a review cycle, you send your content over the other side of the table and you should get some comments and hopefully move forward. Um, that estimation, so human to human estimation, is exceptionally hard. Um, you're, you're kind of like in mind reading territory as a planner if, you, if, you're, if you're capable of doing this very, very well. Um, and, and, and this, this um, jumped out at me because very often when, when we as Enplan are working on projects, the very first thing we get asked about are the production level activities. Like, how will you know how ab about our concrete pours? Like, well, we can help you a little bit there, but really we should be talking about the other things that you're not going to focus on, right? It's the, the things that are unintuitive to the mind to like go and dig deep. Um, I'm interested, uh, I, I want to connect two things before I pass it to Glenn, um, which is something that Simon said, if you thought the pandemic was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet, um, which is around um, the combination of market heat. Um, there is more work in the UK right now than there has ever been. Um, there is more jobs to be tendered, more work to be done. We are spending an enormous amount of money on construction uh, today, and that that doesn't seem to be going down right now. Um, yet uh, we have this strain on our um, on our supply chain to be able to deliver work, and I'm now postulating that. No, I'm not postulating anything. The data is saying this: um, that review and approvals are. And the way we run our administrative work is what's causing pain on projects, right? Um, I'm interested, Glenn, as you know, Langaroke is obviously hopefully capitalizing on some of the heat, um, but, but also that heat means that you're going to, um, you know, there are going to be challenges in front, right? Um, t tell us a little bit about how you're handling these things. Yeah, I guess the, one of the things that we are seeing is that it's taking, um, it's taking tenders much longer. You know, I see that, I don't know whose tender period that refers to. Um, but it is, it is taking longer for decisions to be made um, about whether or not to award. And there's a, I think you know, there's probably elements of bill shock uh, as mm -hmm. a result. You know, they're expecting one number to come in and they get four tenders in that are 20 or 30% higher than what they were expecting. And it can cause a bit of paralysis as to, well, does the business case of this project still make sense? Uh, and you know that there's almost I don't, sometimes maybe there's not a recognition that not making a decision is a decision in itself. Uh, and so as you as you wait, the problem is getting worse because we mm -hmm. haven't managed to lock away key key orders or get uh, you know capacity locked away in factories, all those things. And you can come back in a few months' time um, and find that that number is even worse. Uh, so I think it is a uh, you know the, I guess that that's the combination of a incredibly busy market with the supply chain uh, shock. Um, and I think, you know, surprisingly for us, you know, we operate in the UK and Australia, we're seeing exactly the same thing in Australia. You know, it's um, just an unbelievably hot market there for infrastructure programs as well. And I also don't know much about this, I haven't looked into it in great detail, but I sort of see the headlines around a, you know, a $2 trillion stimulus package in the US. And you just start thinking, well, that, mm that is going to have an impact globally. If someone spends $2 trillion on, on this, you know, that is going to be taking all of these key commodities. If you go right back to, to mining, that's all going to have to flow through the supply chain. Um, and so, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me to see some of these uh, administrative tasks um, there. But certainly when you think about our organisation, you know, we don't spend probably enough time thinking about these things. The thing that we've, you know, we've got loads of engineers and loads of project project managers and project delivery people, and what gets them excited is the engineering challenge. Uh, so they, they probably don't, you know, we probably don't get as animated as we should about solving this because we're so excited about, you know, how can we move that off-site and how can we do that quicker and can that be modular and all of these things which engineers love solving. Um, this is probably not as exciting to solve. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, should we get on to the existential challenges? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> no, I, I, just as we went into the first shutdown, was it nearly, well, over two years ago, um, I was actually listening to Radio 4, and they had a, a Peter Hennessy, the historian, was on. And, and he was talking about existential crises. And he said, you know, this looks like an existential crisis. And the last one we had was World War II. And the point he was making is these things don't come along very often, but when they come along, they are highly disruptive. 
not always, in, not totally in a negative way. They tend to, if, if, you, if you catch them right, they are disruptive in doing what you're doing today and they tend to accelerate things that you were planning to do anyway. Now, the reason I say that is that if you look at, it's really picking up what Glenn was saying, if you, if you add together um, the effects of our commitments on, uh, to reduce carbon emissions, you know, if you, if you are as big a nerd as me and go around and read all the government reports and all the rest of it, the impression, what you, you'll suddenly realise that all of this implies a complete restructuring of our electricity supply system because all of that energy which presently comes from diesel and petrol and gas is going to have to come from electricity, generally in various ways. It implies a complete rethinking of physical arrangements on our motorway network for recharging vehicles, complete rethinking of the railway so that operates on electricity, etc., etc. Now, if you add all that up, um, it comes to a massive number in terms of, you know, it's, it's off the scale of a doubling of current levels of investment in infrastructure. Then, as Deb was saying, you add on all the other things that are happening. So the effect of our you know, first war in Europe in, in, in almost living memory, um, what that's doing is causing everybody to accelerate their, commi their commitments to reduce their dependency on oil and gas. I was talking to a colleague in Stuttgart a couple of weeks ago, uh, and he was saying to me that this calculation has been done there, that just the German government, just the German government saying they're going to accelerate various changes to minimise or to limit their dependency on Russian oil and gas. That's doubling again the investment there. Yeah. So what we're seeing here is a massive increase in intensity of activity. And at the same time, through the pandemic and through the war in Europe, we're seeing big, big disruption to supply chains and disruption to availability of skilled people. This very same colleague in Stuttgart who produces a really interesting uh, production system uh, called LCM Digital, he was telling me, oh, didn't you realise that all the software was developed in Kiev? And he said, all those fantastic pe young people who developed my software are now all in uniform fighting a war. So, <laughs> so I think what, the reason I say this is I think where we're heading is a period of, if we, if we are going to achieve all our stated goals of massively increased activity, big disruption to supply chains, big disruption to skills. And we have to find a way through this. And I would say that if we just have faith in the traditional way of doing it, it's going to end in tears, for sure. I want to take us to the final point for the evening, uh, and then we will open it up to the audience, um, which is around, uh, this, is going to con this is going to link up with, you could call it the, the heat, the amount of capital going into the market. Um, do we actually build projects the way we plan to build them? Um, the best project in the world would have a flat line, so there would be no peaks and troughs inside here. That means all we ever did was our plan. That's it. Um, <laughs> um, the boring project is the best project. Um, uh, we, we have a little bit of a league table in here between buildings and infrastructure. Um, and broadly what we're saying here, um, the reason there's peaks in this first, so on the, on the bottom of the on the graph is uh, project evolution or time. And then on the left hand side, we're basically saying early on in the project, we end up not doing the things that we plan to do. Right? So we're missing stuff. It means are known as miss starts or fail starts. So we just don't bother doing stuff. We say, we're going to plan all of these wonderful activities. We're going to do these reviews and we're going to have a governance meeting. We're going to make sure we set everything up perfectly. Right? Start strong is a very commonly used phrase in, in project management. You know, start the project off really, really well, and then you're off to the races. Um, and we don't do that, right? We push back, we punt and say, we'll do that bit later, we'll do that bit later, we'll figure that out later. Um, we'll catch up later, classic words, right? We miss that, we'll catch up later. Um, and, and the reason this ends up becoming a delay is because the graph is more centered, skewed towards rising on the left, which means we miss, a, we miss a bunch of stuff. And then right at the end, we try and play catch up. The last 70 or 80% of the projects, we play a game of catch up. And there's no way you can catch up 70% in, in the remaining 30%, right? Mathematically, that's not going to work out very well. And then you end up with the delay. But this tendency of um, not being able to look, in, in, in the oil and gas world, where I come from, it used to be called front-end loading, right? Make sure you do the right amount of upfront work to be able to execute your project well. 
um, and, and linking me perhaps a bit to what Glenn said, is this eagerness to like get the shovel in the ground um, and start building. Um, and this, this, this discrepancy, especially when you come in with a market that's now saying, we now need to double the amount of investments we need in order to become uh, a carbon neutral nation. Um, well, you, how do you double the amount of investments you're going to take without making this graph worse, right? If this graph becomes worse, projects become worse, meaning if the graph starts extending itself on the left-hand side upwards and we start missing more stuff and creating further delay, right? Um, interested in starting with Claire's perspective on how do we not make it worse? <laughs> I think we do tend to rush from one project to another to another, and we forget to learn the lessons from the project. And when you get to the end point, the people who were involved in the early stages have moved on to other projects, and that corporate memory is gone. So you're not actually getting the legacy from those projects to actually work out what went wrong, how can we do it better in the future. It's sort of retrospective looking back, and those events have gone. Um, but it's also, I think it's quite interesting what Glenn was saying about the tender periods getting longer. I think they are getting longer, but I think also when the client pushes the button, they expect things to happen straight away. So then rather than actually taking the time to work out, right, what do we need to do to make this right, and is there a rush to get things onto site, I think perhaps we're not actually taking the time to plan things properly, because the client wants to see results, they want to see something actually being built, something being dug, some concrete being poured. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's a really... Um I have to, at some point, say you know contractors have very thin margins. Be remiss of me not to say that, <laughs> but you know what that does mean is that you do need to start thinking at the end of a project about where those expensive resources are going to be deployed productively. So you can absolutely end up with that issue of having to have key resources straddling because you just uh, most contractors don't have the resilience to say we can have a period of um, you know downtime between projects when they're sitting down, writing a detailed lessons learned document, uh, putting it in a format that everyone can read, going around telling everyone about it and engaging people in what they can do better. Um, you know, that's just not, not a world that we have the luxury of being able to do. Um, we're trying to do something about that by trying to do those lessons learned on a more regular basis you know, mm -hmm. sort of through, through networks of people and connecting them intimately, you know, through the, uh, intermittently through the year, not intimately. Um, <laughs> to, uh, to try and share those things as they're happening so they can actually hear from another project director on a call how they tackled those. But I think that, that corporate memory thing is a big, but, a but big should, piece. Should that lie with the client, though, rather than you as a contractor? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it's one of these things where everyone, everyone has a role, to, a role to play, a role to play there. Um, I have another thought, but I've forgotten it. Sorry. <laughs> so someone's got just, one. Just, just two quick ones. <laughs> I've never understood why orthodox project management people think that the sooner you start something, the sooner you'll finish it. It's complete nonsense. There's this early start culture. I've never understood it. All the evidence is that the later you leave it, the better you plan it, the more efficient it is. The other thing in infrastructure, and this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem on infrastructure programs as they have become more and more about technology and less and less about concrete and steel, um, the, the, the back end of a pr big program is the really difficult bit, as Crossrail found out. Um, and I would say that, um, first of all, the people that start big programs tend to be civil engineers like me. And the problems that the really difficult issues later on tend to be technology issues and operational issues, which they tend not to have a deep understanding of. So we don't make that transition well. The other thing is actually, Taking a big complex piece of technology, you know, like an airport terminal or a crossrail or whatever, or railway, into operation and going through all of the institutional things you have to do to, to, be, to be able to actually to go from a finished project to something you can take paying passengers on, that is a massive job. Um, years ago, and this is the last time I mentioned Terminal 5, when we were planning T5, we realised that what, the putting it to use, into use was as big a project as building it. And we actually set up a completely separate team called the Operational Readiness Team that ran in parallel with the people designing and building it that looked after everything to do with getting it to work. Uh, and I think that was repeated also in the London Olympics. They had an Operational Readiness Team. So, so two points. Get your planning right before you start. Don't think that running around putting spades in the ground is going to help anybody. And secondly, think deeply about the back end of a programme. Mm. Yep. 